It's that time of the year again where I rank my top 10 favorite TV shows that aired in the previous year. I believe I saw exactly 10 airing shows in 2017 and 13 in 2018, but in 2019 I saw a total of 15 and considered watching more, but I simply didn't have the time. So in the outro I'll showcase the shows I didn't get to watch this year, whether I was interested in a new one or dropped one I used to follow. This intro on the other hand shows the 5 shows that didn't make the list, so consider them honorable mentions, even though they're not that near the top 10. So what is the top 10, and is it better than previous lists? Was 2019 a satisfying end to the decade in regards to TV? Tune in to find out, and beware of spoilers for the shows I talk about. Number 10. The Dragon Prince, Seasons 2 and 3. This is a pretty well regarded show by now and I only put it at number 10? Don't I like it or something? I actually do like it, and it was hard to decide whether to put this in 10th or a few spots higher. That being said, I did find it a bit underwhelming, just like when I started the show. I expect quite a lot from it, being handled by Avatar The Last Airbender's head writer, and while it did have great moments, I'm still not completely won over. I found season 3 particularly disappointing, since I saw the action pack trailer beforehand that mostly just showed off the final episode which felt rushed anyway. I actually prefer season 2, that being my favorite season of the show so far, because it felt better paced, had way better characterizations, and upped its animation frames. That's not to say season 3 is bad, it is basically on par with season 1, but I expected a lot more from it. I'm also disappointed with how for example Claudia's character got treated, being blind for her clearly messed up dad, Viren, while Soren surprisingly became the voice of reason this season. Oh well, both seasons were still overall really good, and I look forward to whatever comes next, but the show is not as good as I hoped it would be, and that's why it's at the bottom of the list. My favorite character is once again Callum, but this time even more so as he was basically the main character of season 2, and while not as active in season 3, he was still very likable and had nice development. You'd think having Sokka's voice would make me see Callum as a Sokka clone, but it's actually pretty easy for me to distinguish the characters. I much prefer Sokka, but Callum is great in his own right, having a good sense of humor and is very sweet, especially towards his brother Esrin, and his now lover Rayla. It's cool that he can use magic too, and the way he unlocked it was pretty crazy, in an awesome sense. My favorite episode is Season 2, Episode 9, titled Breathe, which is my favorite episode of the show so far. While it's not an explosive final like Season 3's, it's a lot better paced, more character driven, and has some crazy moments. It was very convenient how Soren got completely healed from his crippling injury, but it wasn't without its ramifications for Claudia, who got pushed over the edge to do some really messed up stuff, which was interesting to witness. Callum finally learned sky magic and used it to great effect to help Sim, which has to be one of the best moments of the show, and required teamwork from quite a few people. Even Esrin got to help out through his strong connection to animals. Speaking of Esrin, him returning home to assume his role as king was great character development, and shows how strong he is, especially since he's so young and just learned about his father's death. Otherwise, there was some action, Viren fighting soldiers with the help of Aravos, who can apparently use several types of magic. That was a very cool scene, and Aravos had some fascinating mystery. An all around great episode, but to be honest, Dragon Prince hasn't quite wowed me yet. Hopefully next seasons will do. Number 9, Milo Murphy's Law, Season 2. It's kinda crazy that it took me this long to watch Phineas and Ferb's successor, but I was skeptical of the show's quality. Phineas and Ferb is one of my favorite shows ever, and is one of the most nostalgic too. I would watch episodes of it almost every time I knew it aired, and I actually watched through the whole thing chronologically three years ago. I don't like Milo Murphy's Law nearly as much, but I have to admit it's pretty good. Season 1 had a good start, with a few really good episodes, and while season 2 isn't much better, it did kick it up a notch. I mean, the season opener was a crossover with its predecessor after all, and on top of that, Doofenshmirtz and Perry were recurring characters, but the show does stand on its own despite that. The concept of Murphy's Law was already interesting, but only got depicted as random occurrences, whereas this season proved that there's a lot more to it, which is brilliant writing. Despite this praise, I have to admit that the individual episodes are pretty hit or miss, and usually don't have enough meat for me to appreciate them fully. Most of them are only about 10 minutes after all, and I tend to favor the longer ones at around 20, or even 45 minutes. I'd also like more songs, which Phineas and Ferb was riddled with almost every episode, most of them being creative and memorable. 
Something that's unique about the show is that it has an overarching plot, and I'm really interested in seeing where that goes. It has already been very interesting, what with all the time travel shenanigans, and discovering the nature of Murphy's Law. Heinz Doofenshmirtz was by far my favorite character of Phineas and Ferb, so you'd think he's also my favorite in Milo Murphy's Law, but I feel like he's not as funny in this show, so I'll just go with the title character, Milo Murphy, instead. His positive outlook on everything despite being so unlucky shows that he's a very strong person, and I love how he has a solution for nearly every problem due to his lifelong experience with such destructive energy. He can also be pretty funny and sing some mean songs. After all, his voice is Weird Al Yankovic. The strongest episodes by far were the season opener as well as the season final, and despite the season opener crossing over with Phineas and Ferb, I'll have to go with the final as it was just too good and didn't even have to rely on Phineas and Ferb. It did feature Doof and Perry, but their roles were pretty minor. I love how the concept of Murphy's Law got elaborated on in this episode, explaining some of the science behind it, and that Milo isn't the only one who suffers from it. An alien girl of the Octalian species has a far worse version of it, to the point that it could even envelop the Octalian's home planet. Fortunately, that doesn't happen as the main characters, as well as many Octalians, all work together to tamper the power, which was really cool to see, and got a bit emotional as the girl in trouble got reunited with her mother. Murphy's Law was put to great effect this episode, and the humor was pretty spot on too. That one Octalian holding his breath in outer space in order to keep his Murphy form led to a really funny twist. Also, the music that was played at the beginning of the episode was really good, and was coupled with some nice visuals. This was such a satisfying final that did a great job at wrapping up the second season, and added more layers to the universe. Number 8. Game of Thrones Season 8 Ah yes, Game of Thrones' insanely controversial final season. It might seem like I placed it too high on the list, and the majority might think it doesn't deserve a spot at all, but hear me out on this. I absolutely adore this show, and despite having its quality drop on numerous occasions, I can't bring myself to flat out hate everything it does poorly, even though I may be disappointed. I was super let down by episode 3, that should have been one of the best episodes yet, but my first impression was really positive. Of course, it did dwindle over time, but it has a lot going for it. Amazing direction in music, very impactful moments, and some great send-offs to great characters like Jor and Theon. The first point I encountered strong disappointment was when Arya killed the Night King, because there could have been so much more to him. I know D&D didn't care much, but they could have done many different things for the Night King to be worthwhile. Considering the show's focus on realism, the season also packed in numerous leaps of logic, like Rhaegal being killed in a near impossible way, and almost no one dying during the long night despite being outnumbered dozens to one, in addition to retconning the death toll. Season 7 also had such inconsistencies, which led me to only put it at 4th in 2017 instead of 2nd or even 1st, but season 8 is definitely way more disappointing than that, especially since everyone else feels that way. The episodes that were supposed to be the strongest had so many problems, so we couldn't even get an episode like The Spoils of War or Hard Home that were strong points to otherwise weaker seasons. I at least still cared a lot to find out what would happen next during those seasons, whereas I kind of lost interest after episode 4 of season 8. The final episodes did have some great moments, but the bells got halted by too much focus on Arya, and especially Danny's drastic decision. Like, she could've just went for Cersei instead of burning literally everyone to a crisp. I wouldn't say the final was awful, but I guess it is by goth standards. So, with all these negatives, why is it on the list, and not even at the bottom? Because like I said, I love this show, and we did get some amazing moments. Got is generally still very good even at its worst, its production value being off the charts, making the music, visuals and direction sublime, and the acting was wonderful as well. Also, like I said, I had almost no issues until the end of episode 3. It was so hard to write a coherent script for this entry, which kind of goes well with the season now that I think about it. It's hard to pinpoint who my favorite character was of this season, because some of my favorites were botched, like Jon, Jaime and Varys, and my all-time favorite Tyrion hasn't been exceptional since season 4. I considered going with Theon, given his consistently amazing development and closure, but he didn't get to do that much, as he had a minor role and only lasted 3 episodes, so I'm going to choose another character that got a redemption arc, that being Sandor Clegane, aka the Hound. He once again brought some funny lines, but more importantly, wrapped up his amazing character arc in a satisfying manner. 
One of the most touching moments in the show, at least this season, was the Hound telling Arya not to go down the same path he went, stopping her from attempting to kill Cersei, which would probably result in Arya's death as well, just like what happened to the Hound while facing his brother. Legain Bolt was pretty good fan service, and the Hound truly went out like the total badass he is, poetically so, as he died falling into flames. Favorite episode has to be 2, A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms, which was the calm before the storm in several ways. This entire episode was just so wholesome, which is very unusual for Game of Thrones since most episodes feature at least one death, but this one had none. It was about characters anticipating their likely deaths, but it was still very warm, quite literally, as multiple characters gathered by the fire. That was probably the best aspect about the episode, just seeing a whole bunch of lovable characters chatting and drinking together. Not only did we get an amazingly sweet scene between Jamie and Brienne from it, but also a super touching song from Podrick that was sung over different shots of people preparing for war. I also liked that Arya and Gendry finally hooked up, and unlike a lot of people, I wasn't bothered by the scene. Trust me, there have been far worse things in the show. For as disappointing as the season was, at least the first two episodes were rather strong, which made these anticipation episodes for the final season no less so damn impactful. Number 7. The Mandalorian Season 1 Finally, we have a live-action Star Wars television show, and while it's a lot different than one would imagine, it works well. I wasn't entirely convinced at first that this was a masterpiece, and I still don't think it is, but the third episode made me really invested, as it was all around amazing. It was awesome seeing Mandalorians in action, and Din Djarin saving Baby Yoda, and the scene at the end where Din gave the baby the steel ball really got to me. I enjoyed some of the filler episodes too, 4 and 6 in particular. I don't get the hate for episode 4. Sure, the woman who was good at shooting should have been explained, and the other villagers were kind of dumb, but the episode was overall very interesting, not to mention wholesome, and had wonderful direction during the fight against that ATST. I do get the criticism for episode 5, however, as that one was boring, unnecessary, and portrayed Din Djarin as irresponsible. By the penultimate episode, I considered putting this show at the bottom of the list. But then I saw the final, and it had to be moved up considerably. The final was simply spectacular, and laid good groundwork for what's to come in season 2. Right now, I don't like this show as much as Clone Wars, The Clone Wars, or Rebels, but it is a strong Star Wars show regardless, that has recently grown on me, and might continue to. Something I have to commend the show for is the way it references those Star Wars cartoons, which it does effortlessly without feeling tacked on, like Maul and Solo for instance. My favorite character is Baby Yoda's caretaker, Din Djarin, who just so happens to be the Mandalorian. Despite being a bit dumbed down here and there, most notably in Episode 5, he's a good character with a cool demeanor. I haven't encountered many, if any, silent protagonists in TV, and for that he's pretty unique, also for not being able to see his face, as you often have to imagine what facial expressions he's making. Silent pro tags are usually reserved for video games, and you all know I'm a fan of that medium, so I quite enjoy this approach. That's not to say he's completely silent, and whenever he does speak, he delivers some good lines. He has an interesting backstory too, which creates context for what he does in the present, like not wanting to turn in Baby Yoda, because Din Djarin sees himself in him. Or the situation those villagers from episode 4 were in, that was pretty similar to his back in the day. He also has a strong identity code, which I can respect. Although episode 3 was where I officially got hooked, the strongest episode was by far the last, Redemption, which was explosive from beginning to end. It started by characterizing a pair of scout troopers, and even poked fun at the Imperial troopers' general bad aim, which was funny. Then the reprogrammed IG-88 unit went ham on everyone, with the other main characters joining the fight. Even Baby Yoda got to do something big, in a scene that reminded me of Eleven from Stranger Things. We finally got to see what Din Djarin looks like, who unsurprisingly resembles Oberyn Martell, but cool scene nonetheless. Knowing how much he despises droids, it was nice seeing him grow to trust one, and ig 88 sacrifice was yet another impactful send-off to a droid, like K2SO in Rogue One, and it was foreshadowed in the pilot. We also got to see the female Mandalorian forger kick some ass, and she gave Din Djarin a jetpack that he actually used, which led to a fantastic spectacle. By the way, Moff Gideon screaming from a bomb gave me major Breaking Bad flashbacks. The final set a great foundation for what's to come, with Baby Yoda needing to be returned to his species, and it also did well at wrapping up Season 1's plot points. It got topped off with a cool reference to the cartoons, that being the Darksaber, which made for one badass wallpaper. It was pretty much a perfect episode all around, and it's great seeing Star Wars receive justice under Disney's control in some fashion. This is the way, and I have spoken.
Number 6, Rick and Morty Season 4. I gotta be honest, while I had been eagerly waiting two years for Game of Thrones and another show that will appear later on the list, I wasn't necessarily that hyped up for this one. When I watched the first episode of this season, however, I realized how much I missed this show. The comedy is so snappy and clever, and to be fair, you need an insanely high IQ to understand it, especially the poop and sex jokes from episodes 2 and 4. Okay, I have to admit that every other episode was hit or miss, 1, 3 and 5 being the hits, whereas 2 and 4 missed the mark. I felt like the latter two were barely eventful, episode 2 having a decent main plot with slightly dull side plots, and episode 4 was just overall super random without much substance. I did laugh from the dragon orgy scenes, but it was meh otherwise. 1, 3 and 5 on the other hand were extremely solid, with insane premises and hilarious comedy. This show might have been higher had there been more episodes out, but apparently it had to be split in two, with the remaining five episodes coming out this year. I'm hoping those retain a more consistent quality, and for plot points like Phoenix Person or Evil Morty to come back into play. I was disappointed we didn't get to see more of them back in Season 3 after the height of the Rick Lantis mix-up, but I didn't actually mind the lack of them while watching Season 4's first half, since every other episode was so strong without having to rely on them. It's obvious who the best character is, as Rick Sanchez simply can't be beat. Sure, Morty stepped up a bit in the season opener especially, and Jerry was hilariously dumb in that last one, but I don't think Rick is ever going to be topped. His inventions never cease to amaze me, where in the season opener he had contingency plans for dying, like making holograms of himself to tell Morty to revive Rick, and even when that failed, he had yet another backup plan to clone himself throughout different dimensions every time he dies. Even though I wasn't a big fan of episode 2, he was still by far the highlight, having created a whole planet for himself to shit in peace, and having drugs that can create a heaven modeled after one's imagination. I can't neglect his brilliant outplace during the heist episode either. He also makes a machine clone people just to replicate their voice. Like, you'd think there'd be far easier and less gruesome ways of doing that, but the fact that he actually made something like that just shows how fucked up he is. His dialogue is also just the best, and he even gives his invention some great dialogue. He always slays it, Queen. I love the season opener, but episode 5 Rattlestar Rick Lactica was actually my favorite. It was such a funny way of doing time travel, and a chunk of the episode had no dialogue. Well, dialogue we can understand anyway, since there was lots of snake hissing. It was really cool seeing a snake society that reflects our own, with snake reporters and baseball players. And snake chess is a better concept than it has any right to be. Whenever someone starts going I'm like, you son of a bitch, I'm in. The fact we got Snake Adolf Hitler is just amazing, and what was even more amazing was when all those time-traveling snakes killed each other, trying to either assassinate or save Snake Dolph Slither. It was also fun seeing the time cops again, this time beating up and trash-talking a prehistoric snake. Something else I loved about the episode was the subplot, this time centered around Jerry, who was in such a comedic situation, proving further how insanely stupid he can be. In the end, the episode was topped off with a nice post credit scene. It definitely wasn't as good as the season opener's after credit scene, but it was still pretty funny, and we got to find out how Morty got his black eye. Huh, maybe he's evil Morty. Number 5, South Park, Season 23. Right after Rick and Morty is the other adult comedy cartoon I follow, which is now over 300 episodes with 23 seasons, and is still going strong. Alright, it's not as strong as I'd like it to be, but it's still great. I'm not sure whether I like this season more than the last, but I feel like it was more varied, despite the first half. That's because the second half had very self-contained episodes, which felt like a breath of fresh air after the Tegrity Weed plot, which I think I enjoyed just as much, minus the Halloween special as that one was kinda boring. I like how Mexican Joker actually came to fruition by the end of that story arc, and in a pretty creative way. The whites may have been a bit too much in your face though, quite literally when they made Mexican Joker by covering his face with sunscreen. The stuff with Trans Macho Man was pretty funny, and actually tied in with what was going on between the boys and the girls playing their board games, and the same episode had a very touching conclusion involving the PC family. The third to last episode also had some funny shit, puns intended, and I'm glad we finally got an episode dedicated to the diabetic Scott Malkinson, who had quite a fun little story there. The season ended on a pretty good Christmas-themed episode which went back to Tegrity and criticized the drug war. A Santa commercial for Coke, as in cocaine and not Coca-Cola, was pretty damn clever if I do say so myself. My favorite character was once again Randy Marsh, because he was obviously the star of the season, what with all the Tegrity Farm stuff going on, as well as playing the biggest role in the season final. He did bug me from time to time, but I overall loved what he did. 
I still have his constantly reused quote, Hey, fuck you, engraved into my mind. And I laugh every time he says it. Also every time he promotes his business, ending with, Now, it just so happens. The dude got to convince China to legalize weed, and in the season final, he got cocaine legalized in several states in a matter of jump cuts. If that's not flexing, I don't know what is. Another great feat of this was killing Winnie the Pooh. As violent and brash as he's been in the past, I don't really recall him committing much murder. And not only did he strangle the Pooh, but he also blew up the yards of many just because they were farming their own weed. He's also so ignorant of his family's views on his business, which further adds to the comedic value. The best episode of the season was for sure episode 2, Banned in China, that actually got South Park banned in China, and just before the 300th episode too. The fact that the episode satirized China's censoring made it even funnier. I appreciate double meanings, and while this episode's title isn't as good as the fractured butt hole, it's still very good, and both meanings are relevant to the episode. It was pretty funny seeing Stan and Crew's edgy band performance, and what was even better was the main boys performing the finger bang again. Now that made me nostalgic. Of course, Randy was great too, making a deal with the white slavers, as George Lucas once called Disney, and rightfully so. The Winnie the Pooh stuff was good too, how he's locked up for being compared to the Chinese president, and being strangled to death by Randy. It was cool seeing other iconic Disney characters as well, including Star Wars and Marvel characters. While this is definitely one of the stronger episodes from season 20 and onwards, it's still just around the top 100 South Park episodes overall. I'm really hoping another masterpiece will come along in the near future, but then, they only need to make faithful license games to keep me satisfied. Number 4, Stranger Things Season 3. This is that other show I waited two years for, and it was quite hard to wait that long to see what would happen next. I'm not the biggest fan of the direction season 2 took, but I was still very intrigued to see what would happen next. The result? I guess it's on par with season 2, but it still doesn't come that close to season 1, which was almost perfectly told. They ignored a lot of plot points from season 2, which is understandable given that the 11 side story wasn't received too well, but it's still weird that it wasn't addressed. That's not to say it won't come back in the future, but that could make the plot even messier. I have enjoyed the Eleven ship in previous seasons, but this time I didn't feel like I cared as much about it as I should've. I guess it's lost its charm since they're a lot older now, meaning it doesn't seem as innocent anymore. And you know, the fact that they temporarily broke up, which I thought was contrived. I think the biggest sin of the season has to be the way Hopper's character got treated. I'm not even referring to him potentially dying, which, yeah, would be a shame if he really is gone for good, but I was more upset about how he acted in general. He had some good scenes, like making Alexei stay without using force, but then there were scenes where he straight up acted like a dad from a sitcom. I know he's been brash before, but this season took it too far. It's a shame, given that he used to be my favorite character. Things I loved about the season was first off episode 4, that really kicked the plot into a higher gear. Episode 6 was also a highlight, especially the ending scene between Eleven and Billy, coupled with that ominous background music which gave me massive goosebumps. Everything involving Alexei was also great, him being a hilarious side character, so it was sad to see him go. The relationship between Steve Harrington and the new character Robin Buckley was so good, and while the ship didn't come true, finding out that Robin is a lesbian was a good subversion. Of course, the final was also epic, super explosive, and very emotional. Season 3 introduced some great side characters in the forms of Alexei and Robin, but I think I liked Steve Harrington this season even more. He's always been a character I've really liked, but I've come to realize that he's probably my favorite character overall. He was great even back in Season 1, with a nice little redemption arc, and that development carried over to Season 2, where he was a great bro to Dustin. And Season 3 continues to show how good of a person he is, while also revealing his insecurities. The way he tried to score while being an ice cream scooper was funny, while simultaneously sad, and I really feel for the guy whenever he gets rejected, by Robin especially. I'm hoping he can scoop up a proper girlfriend eventually. Ahoy for my boy! The best episode was by far the final, which I believe is my second favorite episode of the series thus far. It hit on every note, whether it be the spectacle, the writing, the emotion, the directing, the music, even the comedic bits. Yeah, the never-ending story duet between Dustin and his girlfriend was pretty entertaining, despite being a tonal shift amidst a very serious situation. The fight with the Mind Flayer was so awesome to watch, using fireworks really made for some stunning visuals, and it kept in line with the theme of July 4th. 
Billy's sacrifice was very well handled, as was Hopper's, and Eleven reading his letter in the end was incredibly touching. Every season final of Stranger Things has all the main characters working together, and it's always wonderful to witness. I wouldn't say the lead up to those moments are the best in season 2 and 3, but the results are always satisfying. What an amazing final, it was only 3 inches away from being top 3 of the year. Number 3, My Hero Academia Season 4. I expected this one to be number 2, but due to unforeseen circumstances it had to be lower. Not only because number 2 is unexpectedly amazing, but also because the direction isn't on par with previous seasons, and it only had 11 episodes in 2019. The art and animation hasn't been as consistent as before, which I also noticed during season 3, but this season has it worse. It might be because I've already read the manga, but there were certain things that didn't hit me as much as when I read it. The Sun Eater fight is a good example, as that was one of my most anticipated moments of the season, and while it was great, I expected more. Some censorship also bugged me, like Hiroshima's arms being covered in black instead of blood. They looked like holes for fuck's sake. The highlight of the arc, that being Lemillion's moment to shine, got botched the most, but I still loved it, luckily. Anyways, while the adaptation part has failed to an extent, the content in question is really damn great. I love the overhaul slash Shie Hasaikai slash 8 Precepts of Death slash Internship arc or whatchamacallit. The characters it introduces are great, like the big three and their mentors, as well as the Yakuza group. Of course, most of them were introduced last season, but this season is where they truly get to show off why they're so cool. The arc also develops Kirishima in particular, who's been in much need of that. I've liked him in past seasons, but this is where it truly began to flourish. It's a bit of a shame we take a break from some of my favorite characters, like Ida, Bakugo, and Todoroki, and it is quite a long break at that, given that this is the longest MHA arc, but to be fair, they've already had their times in the spotlight. What's more of a shame is that the raid team consisting of Uravity, Froppy, Nejirichan, and Ryukyu don't get much screen time at all, and that's the biggest team, which shows how underused the females are. The other two teams however are simply amazing and get so much attention, it's just a shame the last team is barely involved. This season definitely brought a lot more stakes, which is needed in this show since no named character had died yet. It's true Magne isn't a major character, but her death gave the League of Villains lasting motivation, plus it was quite a tone shift seeing her get obliterated by Overhaul, which set him up to be quite the threat. His subordinates are too, as one of the eight bullets did shoot Lemillion and removed his quirk permanently. There's also a little girl who needs to be rescued, who's been through hell and back by the hands of Overhaul, being constantly deconstructed and reconstructed. I also have to mention Sir Nighteye's death, which I know happened this year, but it still speaks to how the consequences have become more severe. Okay, so the main character, Deku, might be my favorite overall, but the funny thing about this arc is that I enjoy at least four characters more, those being Fatgum, Tamaki, Kirishima, and my favorite, Mirio. These characters get their own moments to shine, but Mirio hit me the most by far, both in the manga and the show. His absolute perseverance despite losing his power is so inspirational, especially since he worked so hard to master his near impossible quirk. Good thing it can compete with even the strongest pro heroes, because Overhaul's power is just too broken, and Mirio still managed to go toe to toe against him without a quirk. You gotta love his costume too, being made of his hair so he can permeate without getting naked. Also, the cape isn't just for show, but also strategic use, and like he said, to bundle up a young girl who's in terrible pain. Also, as a Star Wars fan, I have to appreciate that one of his special moves is called Phantom Menace, which of course just had to be censored, but he still said it, in Japanese at least. No matter, my headcanon is still that he's a certified prequel memer, and that's why Sir Nida chose him. There's been debate that he should have gotten one for all instead of Deku, but I disagree. It's better to have two functioning heroes instead of one, especially when Lemillion can compare to the best of pro heroes, even without his quirk. Just like my favorite character, my favorite episode was Lemillion, that being episode 11. This episode probably got the worst treatment compared to how well it should have been adapted at least, seeing as it's one of the biggest moments in the arc, let alone season, let alone series. It for sure was my most anticipated upcoming moment, and it's a shame it wasn't adapted as well as it should have. That being said, I absolutely adored it despite that. While the fight should have had more animation, it was still awesome to watch. Seeing Mario use his unique power is always fun, as well as Overhaul's quirk, which is basically alchemy. The fight was an escort mission, which I hate in video games, but at least I don't have to play the section when I watch it in the show, and it still delivers the thrills. 
I love seeing Mirio take on so many enemies and creatively taking them out, while also protecting Aerie. That ultimately became his undoing, but he has no regrets about losing his own power in order to save her, which just shows how much of a hero he truly is. I did feel more from the scene where he lost his quirk in the manga, but I still got teary-eyed while watching it in the anime, even if the slideshow was a bit anticlimactic. Bones really needs to get back on their A-game. They animated Fire Force and Mob Psycho the same year for fuck's sake. More recent episodes have looked amazing though. I just hope that quality stays consistent now that there won't be more MJ movies. Number 2, Vinland Saga Season 1. Here's the show that surprised me the most, being able to top titans like South Park, Stranger Things and even My Hero Academia. This is one of the only shows I've followed since its inception and it's by far my favorite out of those. I decided to watch it because I had heard the manga is one of the greatest of all time, and because it's animated by Wit Studio, which is the same team behind my number one. Furthermore, the Viking Age is really interesting, especially since it largely concerns my country, Norway. Now, Vinland Saga hasn't showcased Norway much, at least not yet, but there have been quite a few mentions of it. The show has focused more on Iceland, Denmark, England and Wales, implementing them well. So, what makes this show so great? It does a good job at portraying how brutal the way of the Vikings was, meaning most of the characters you follow pack shades of grey. There are some really complex characters, and even some that didn't seem very complicated, like Torkel managed to surprise me by repeatedly showing other sides of himself, despite only seeming like a dumb brute. There was also fantastic development for Prince Canute, who was initially a spoiled crybaby, but transformed into a brave king. I don't find the main character Torfinn all that interesting yet, as he's solely driven by revenge, but I do expect his upcoming arc to be a grand one. This show has one of the better beginnings I'd say, even though there were some things that bugged me, particularly the leaps of logic in terms of what these humans can accomplish. Torfinn can apparently scale huge distances, and Askeladd can cut people in half, including their helmets and armors if he's angry enough, and don't even get me started on Torkel. I got more used to it over time, and it is entertaining watching Torkel chuck entire logs at boats, or throw a spear through five men from a hundred meters away. It does add a bit more to the action, which has been really well animated. On the topic of animation, I did notice some cases where it was bad, but it's usually really good, with some incredible art on top of that. I said the start was great, but the ending was simply phenomenal. Every episode from 17 and onwards had so many amazing moments, the writing is just damn stellar. It includes some thought-provoking philosophical questions, like what makes a real warrior, whether Christianity is a solution for the messed up way of the Vikings, or how love is defined. It's also interesting how some of the characters' motivations to strive for a better world basically intersects with the idea of Vinland. Take Canute for example, who wants to reshape the world into a peaceful one, and Askeladd wants the same by bringing back the hero of legend. And of course, Torfinn and Leifeidikson want to visit the supposed paradise that is Vinland, to escape the world's cruelty. I loved Canute and Torkel, but it's no secret that my favorite character was Askeladd by far. Throughout the season, and especially the second half, he was shown to be not only an Aska mad lad, but also an Aska chad. The writing of this character was simply phenomenal from beginning to end. To think that the character who killed the main protagonist's father, a whole village of innocent Christians, and even his own crew became so lovable. Of course, I wouldn't want him to exist, but as a fictional character, I love him, and every time I got to learn more about him, I was super intrigued. He's such a dick to everyone, and yet he does care about some of the people he's being a dick towards. He despises the way Torfinn is unable to change, and in his dying breath, he tells Torfinn to actually do something productive about his life and become a true warrior, like his father before him. Askeladd's closest companion Bjorn knows that Askeladd hates his men, but when Bjorn's dying words was warning to be friends with him, Askeladd eases Bjorn's pain by telling him he actually was his only friend. There's also his sheer loyalty towards Canute because of his mother's wish, that he cherished until the very end. Askeladd was for sure a top tier character of 2019, and while it's sad we won't see more of him, he certainly made his impact on the show, and I thought his ending was perfect. Speaking of his ending, favorite episode was the final, episode 24, end of the prologue, bar none. That episode had it all really, whether it be writing, direction, tension, stakes, action, etc, and was a perfect way to wrap up the season. The episode solidified Askeladd as one of the greatest characters in fiction, and it even boosted the characters of Torkel and Canute somewhat. Canute finally became the king, since, you know, Askeladd straight up beheaded former King Swain, and although it was very bold, it felt natural. 
Torkel contributed almost no comedy this time, which is unusual, and he was unexpectedly serious, which I highly appreciated. We might have lost Askelad, but Knut and Torkel should be able to carry their team moving forward. The Ask and Mad Lad straight up killed the king and convinced the others he was trying to grab the crown for himself, which Knut played into, telling the guards to kill him. Knut dealing the final blow was necessary as well, instructed by Torkel, because that would be the perfect opportunity to seize the crown. It was sad that Torfinn left life behind again, and I always feel so bad for life, but it resulted in such a fantastic scene, where Torfinn witnessed Askeladd die right in front of him. Askeladd is Torfinn's target for his vengeance after all, and yet Torfinn couldn't bring himself to finish him off. It's like Torfinn actually saw Askeladd as his other father, despite how terribly Askeladd treated him. I love how the shot of Torfinn grabbing a dying Askeladd with a white background perfectly mirrors the shot of Torfinn grabbing a dying Thors. That was a great parallel. Another neat touch was the recapping of scenes inside of Torfinn's blade as the dagger fell to the ground. That also made me emotional. My only problem with the episode is the tease at the end for upcoming arcs, as it felt jarring, but that's just a minor nitpick. I'm really hoping season 2 won't take forever, but I do know Wit is busy, like adapting the next show on the list. I'm amazed that the final weekend of 2019 had a streak of magnificent episodes to wrap up the decade, consisting of The Mandalorian's Redemption, My Hero Academia's Lemillion, and finally, Vinland Saga's End of the Prologue. Number 1. Attack on Titan Season 3 Part 2 There was absolutely no doubt in my mind that Attack on Titan would be my number one of the year after I passed a certain episode, and it turns out I was right. Before it aired, it didn't seem like I cared as much about the show anymore. After all, I did hesitantly put AOT in number 2 last year as I considered putting Voltron above it, but after rewatching all of AOT, I can easily say it's my number one of every year since 2017. This part made me realize how truly ingenious the writing is, where the basement reveal along with Grisha's memories answered so many pressing questions we've had for years, as well as recontextualizing the story moving forward. It also had lots of action and incredibly high stakes, where almost 200 Serbicorp soldiers had to die in order to retake Wol Maria, and that included Commander Irwin's life, which is no small loss. That was such a terrific scene by the way, when they all charged the Beast Titan to create a diversion for Levi. By the way, Levi slicing the Beast Titan was absolutely satisfying to watch, as was the Armor Titan's takedown, and especially the Colossal Titans. And these all happened within the same episode, Hero, which is one of the greatest episodes in television. This part was so amazing, but I do have some flaws with the set of episodes. Nothing's perfect after all. There were some dips in animation, notably the CGI on the Colossal Titan, and when Eren fought the Armor Titan, but it was mostly pretty great. Armin surviving being burnt to a crisp, as well as falling down 50 meters was super convenient. I know people have survived falling from even greater heights, and AOT doesn't exactly follow real world logic, but it still felt unnatural. It did lead to perhaps the most emotional episode though, where either Armin or Erwin had to be sacrificed. The Titan's ability to transfer their consciousness was also rather convenient, and it should have been mentioned beforehand so it wouldn't have come out of nowhere. Also, it was kind of a shame we didn't see more of Grisha's journey to the walls, or how he found Armin and Mikasa, but to be fair, my expectations were at their peak going into the last episodes. That made the season final slightly underwhelming as well, but in retrospect, it was amazing. The Survey Corps finally completed their half-decade mission of reclaiming Wall Maria, and even killed all the titans surrounding it. It's not over yet, however, as they'll be fighting Marley next, which should be incredibly interesting. That last scene by the ocean was super impactful, both looking and sounding beautiful, and I loved the shocked expressions of everyone there, except for Eren, of course, since he had already seen it from Grisha's unpleasant memories. The final quote by Eren really made me depressed, how he thought there was freedom by the sea, when in reality there are just more enemies. It was topped off with an amazing score, and Hiroyuki Sawano really deserves all the music awards. He's created by far one of the best soundtracks ever in any medium. Choosing my favorite character is as tough as choosing who to turn into a titan, and it just so happens that I also have to choose between Armin and Erwin, so this is quite the meta situation. Armin was amazing, figuring out how to find the enemy, as well as how to defeat the colossal titan, requiring his sacrifice in order to accomplish that. He's also just so sweet, and seeing his happiness after reaching the ocean made me happy in return. That being said, I have to go with the one who didn't get chosen, Erwin Smith. This guy had his final stance, and what a way to go out. 
I absolutely love his voice in both versions, despite the English dub being lackluster overall. But you can't go wrong with the voice behind Scar, Ida, and Okabe, nor the Japanese Jotaro, so it's safe to say I absolutely love this speech, where the voice actors put in all their energy. The fact that he convinced so many new recruits to die along with him is just phenomenal, and it actually led to results. There's a reason a lot of people claimed they would join a suicide charge with him. It was great hearing one last Chenzo Sasagio, which is a phrase that automatically puts his Japanese performance over his English. There was also some great character building for him prior to the charge. Him admitting he would sacrifice it all to live to see the truth is indeed pretty selfish, which made it so satisfying when he actually ended up sacrificing himself for the greater cause. I would say it was a good decision to let Erwin die instead of Armin, since Erwin's ambition is kind of over after reaching the basement, whereas Armin wants to continue beyond reaching the sea. Erwin went out in the best way possible, leading his soldiers and Levi choosing his resting place. The fact that he became my favorite even though he only lasted 4 episodes proves how good of a character he is. Indeed, he gave his heart. Okay, so I claim that Hero is one of the best episodes in television, but that was only my second favorite episode from this core of episodes, let alone the whole series. Surely, the best one had to be episode 8, that day. This episode revealed gigantic stuff in spades, and made many things back in prior seasons a lot clearer, from the titan shifter situations, to how Eren was able to use the founding titan's power for just a moment, and why Eldians of the Walls haven't made contact with humans from the outside. The episode is also loaded with easter eggs to past events. The creation of the walls showed colossal titans standing right next to each other with their arms crossed together, just like how the religious fellows pray in church. The titans we saw all the way back in episode 5, including the one that swallowed Eren, are members of the underground resistance that Grisha was a part of. Not only that, but we got to learn the identity of the smiling titan, and what a revelation, that Grisha's first wife Dinah was the one to eat his second wife Carla, as well as Hannes who tried to avenge Carla. Even more fucked up, Eren led to that titan's death, not realizing it was his dad's former wife. The even older backstory was also mind-blowing to learn, and I'm surprised I never got spoiled on the fact that the walls are located on an island, nor the conflict between Marlians and Eldians. Their whole situation is fucked up, Marlians intentionally using Eldians to become titan weapons that kill other Eldians. The oppression is absolutely wild, and it should lead to some fascinating stuff moving forward. I love watching reactions to this episode, as every reactor I've come across has said they need to rewatch the episode to gather all the info. I myself had to pause the episode constantly in order to understand everything. It just had so much information packed into it, with revelation after revelation. It didn't even need the main characters, nor fight scenes to be the best episode of the show that is widely known for being action packed. But I'd say the mystery aspect is what AOT does best. As you can probably tell, this episode was the one where I knew Attack on Titan was TV show of the year. Well, I already knew that by episode 5, Hero, but that day just proved it even further. Definitely one of the best episodes I've ever seen of anything. That's it for my top 10 TV shows of 2019, and what a great year it was for television. Yeah, there were some disappointments, most notably Game of Thrones, and shows like South Park and Stranger Things are past their prime, but we also got some great new shows like The Mandalorian and especially Vinland Saga, not to mention some great sequels like Rick and Morty and Attack on Titan. The gap is quite wide between number 1 and 2, but I still consider Vinland Saga amazing. It's just that Attack on Titan reached masterpiece levels. In any case, Wit Studio killed it this year. Now the question remains, will 2020 be even better? While I'm not sure whether all these shows will return, I'm pretty certain we'll get more Primal, Dragon Prince, Mandalorian, Rick and Morty, South Park, Stranger Things, My Hero Academia, and Attack on Titan, and I know that Better Call Saul, Westworld, and The Clone Wars will return. It could go either way, but I bet next year will also be strong, and I'll probably get into a few more airing shows so I can add more to the list. You might notice a lack of 13 reasons why, and that's because I dropped it. I might pick it back up, but I think I have better things to do with my time. I'm Arcadon and hopefully you'll see me next time!